we will see God's glory. We will see His glory. We will not give up. We will not give up. We will see His glory. We will believe. For He has said it and He will do it. He has said it and He will do it. Don't, don't, don't be afraid. Don't get worried. Just pretend you are mad. Pretend you are a fool. Pretend you don't think. I can't think far. Pretend you can't think far. You can't think madness. Pretend I can't think far. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just marching around terrible because God has said it. And I know in due course, if I don't give up, I will achieve. How can you say you are sleeping with somebody in the same room? You are not married on the same bed. And you tell me that they happened. You are a joker. Both the lady and the guy, they are jokers. They don't know what they are talking about. If he's a pastor, he's a joker. Sexual sin is never an accident. Something is about to happen. A change is coming. There is something in the spirit. I has not seen. He has not heard. He has entered the heart of man. What God has prepared for those who love him. Even as the word of God is coming, I want you to pray in the spirit for some few seconds. Warm up your heart to receive the word of God. Put your spirit on the same wavelength as the word that is coming. Ibrando shibraha kalayande siyataha. Kobaha taya lebro lo zi kroko shibroho taha. No zi paha taya kala kaloko se higaha. Ia malia dalaba kose in kolobahosa. Re bakoria la sirian dalaba kose him. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. Father, we thank you for this time in your presence. We pray, O God, that you be with us even as your word of righteousness is coming with great power and might. We pray that, Lord, you help us to open our hearts to receive your word. Let your word do a deep work in our hearts that we may conform to the image of your son. We give you praise in Jesus' name. We pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. We thank God for today. We've been talking about building according to pattern for the past three weeks. We've been talking about building according to pattern. Last week, we, we talked about how heaven citizens live on earth. And today, I'm teaching on the full cycle of life. The full cycle of life um, for the believer. The believer's full cycle of life. Or the full cycle of life of the believer. And I trust God that by the time we finish today, everybody will know where you are spiritually and how the next level you must move on to and how to move on to the next level that God has for you. God is a parent. He's a father and he has expectations of his children. And God is a God of process and a God of growth. So he has expectations of his children. And at every stage of our lives, God has what he wants us to do and be. And we must all the time be acquainted with the current state that we are and the next stage that we must progress into. Now, God has expectations not only of us as individuals, but also of the church corporately. He has expectations of the church and then as individuals. Now, the ultimate purpose of God for giving us the new birth or eternal life is that we may conform to the image of his son. The last, last two weeks I said that the goal of Christianity is not heaven, but the goal of Christianity is conforming to the image of the son. That is what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 29. And we are going to read some scriptures um, Romans chapter 8 verse 29 
it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, God wants to have exact replica of Jesus. He wants to have people who become the exact representation of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, corporately, God also has the same um, expectation for the church, the corporate church. I'm talking about the, the, the global church, the body of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse um, 11, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is God's expectation for the whole church, that the whole church will come to a point where we are just like Christ, that the church will be the exact representation of Jesus Christ. Now, throughout the Bible, both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, and especially in the Old Testament, we have models that God has given us, models of Christian journey, or um, certain, certain things that will help us to assess our growth. Indices, we call them indices of growth, or indices of development. And we have them throughout the Old Testament. We can talk about Ezekiel 47. We can talk about uh, the various journeys of the people of God in the Old Testament. For instance, the people of Israel journeyed from Egypt through the wilderness to Canaan. And we can use their journey. Their journey typifies the journey that the believer makes from the new birth till you get to the fullness of Christ. When you are born again, you are delivered from Egypt. You go through the wilderness where God begins to disciple you and teach you intimacy, teach you how to grow and all that. Then you get to a point where now God gives you your inheritance or you begin to access the inheritance of your father. That is Canaan. Canaan is not a type of heaven because there is no war in heaven. Canaan is a type of our inheritance in Christ. That is why when they got to Canaan, they had to fight because by that time, God had trained them to fight so they could lay hold on their inheritance. So their life, their journey becomes a model for us to measure our Christian growth. Another model in the Old Testament is the journey that Elijah and Elisha took from Gilgal to Jordan. Elijah was about to be taken away to heaven by God and Elisha was a servant. He had been a servant for some time, serving Elijah. And Elisha got to know that God was going to take his master away. And he didn't want him to go just like that without giving him something. He wanted a double portion of his spirit. So Elijah took a journey and he persuaded Elisha to stay behind. They were at Gilgal and from Gilgal he said, God has sent me to Bethel. So you stay in Gilgal. He said, no. As surely as the Lord lives and your soul lives, I will not leave you. And he followed him to Bethel. Now, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, people's names and the names of places were themselves stories and lessons. I mean, you could see somebody's name and the person's name is a reflection of his character. For instance, Nabel in the Old Testament, Nabel, his, his name meant a fool. And you could see from his character that he was, he was a fool. Now, the reason why they started in Gilgal is that Gilgal is a place where the reproach of Egypt is rolled away. According to Joshua chapter 5, verse, Joshua chapter 5, um, I think verse 8, the Lord told Joshua to circumcise all the people of Israel who had been through the wilderness but had not been circumcised. And after the circumcision, God said, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt. So Gilgal is the starting point. It's a point where the reproach of Egypt is rolled away. The point where you become born again, you are separated from the world. 
where you are delivered from the powers of darkness, where God has translated you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his light, of his, of his son of love. That is the starting point, Gilgal. But from Gilgal, they went on to Bethel. The word Bethel means house of God. El means Elohim. Beth is house. Bethlehem, house of bread. Bethel, house of God. And so from Gilgal, they went to Bethel. That was when uh, 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 Elijah again told Elisha, stay here in Bethel and God has sent me to Jericho. And he said, as soon as you leave and your soul leaves, the Lord leaves. I will, not, I will not leave you. I will go with you. Now, Bethel is a place where we can be compared to the house of God, the quarry of God, where God begins to teach you how to relate with one another in the body, where God begins to teach you the value of fellowship, where God begins to disciple you, nurture you with truth. That is Bethel. Now, Jericho is a place which was... Um, called the city of palm trees the city of palm trees it was it was a city of palm trees city of flourishing prosperity abundance and all that and jericho is a type is, is, is another stage in your life in your christian life when you begin to have a foretaste of god's i mean your right and your privileges in christ that is jericho when you begin to know what Jesus Christ has come to die for and how he has, he has died for you and that the things that he has, his death has purchased for you on the cross. You begin to know those things and begin to live and assess them. You begin to know that um, by his stripes we, we, I was healed. You begin to know that he was rejected that I, I might be accepted. You begin to know that um, um, he was put to shame that I may be glorified. All these things you get to know them in Jericho, but it is a type. Then Jordan is the ultimate. So this is just one example, one model that we can use to describe how the believer grows. Now, another one is Ezekiel 47, where the Bible says Ezekiel had a vision and he saw a certain man who was measuring for him to cross a certain uh, uh, river. The water was flowing from the temple. Let's read Ezekiel 47. He says, Then he brought, verse 1, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. He brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around, the, around on the outside to the outer gateway. That faces east, and there was water running out on the right side. Verse 3. And when the man went out, when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The water came up to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees. You see that? As he measured, he was going deeper. At first it was at his ankle, then he came to his knee, which means he had gone deeper. Then again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the water, and the water came up to my waist. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. Now, this is a picture of stage-by-stage stage growth and development. It's a picture of various stages you can find in Christianity. And as, as I go along, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to be referring to uh, all these things. That's why I've taken time to read them. I'm going to be referring to the journey of Elijah. I'm going to be referring to Ezekiel 47. And also, I'm going to be referring to Acts 1.8. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world. That also represents a journey from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the uttermost part or to the farthest ends of the, of the world. As you go, the circle 
increases, you know, the cycle increases from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the world. It also connotes a process. It connotes process that you go through a process and then as you go through the process, you are also growing. The Bible says we grow from glory to glory. It's a Second Corinthians 3.18 It says that as we behold him in the mirror, we are being transformed. Second Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with unveiled face, beholding us in the mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we are being transformed from glory to glory. As we behold him in the mirror, the mirror is the word of God. The word of God is the mirror that we look into. When you look into this mirror, you will see Jesus, the, the perfect man. You will see him. You will see him in the mirror. You don't see yourself. You see him in the mirror. But as you begin to look at him and look at him, then you are growing and being transformed from glory to glory. Till you come to a point where you look into the mirror, then you see yourself. Because you have become just like him. That is God's ultimate for every believer. That will become just like Jesus. That when you look into the mirror now, right now, then you will see yourself because you have been transformed into his image. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to take you through five stages of the believer's um, uh, cycle and then we'll know the full cycle. How we'll know whether we've gone the full cycle or not. Do you know that even in this life, we have cycles. We have different levels of maturity and growth. In this life, uh, you can even divide this life that we have into four stages. You can talk about the stage of learning. When you are young, you are born into a family, you are growing, you know, you learn from your environment. From there, you go to the stage of discovery, where you start discovering things for yourself. When you become an adolescent, you start discovering things for yourself, discovering things about yourself, about your environment, about your friends, about society. You start forming your opinions about life and all that. Then you get to a stage where you begin to contribute back to society. Instead of contribution, where you, if uh, you, you go to school, you have completed, you, you've gotten, gotten a job, you've gotten married, and you are, you are bringing forth children, and you are training them, you are also contributing something back to society, or something back. It's the stage of contribution. Then the final stage is the stage of harvest where you have also retired and you are reaping from your contribution. So you see that even in natural life, we have stages. The same thing applies to spiritual life. The same way that sometimes we say somebody has, has died prematurely because maybe he, he didn't live to full age. We can also, we can also, we can also live to full age in the spirit. We must also live to full age in the spirit. When somebody grows and the person grows old and dies, he has seen his grandchildren, he, he has raised all his children and they are grown-ups and all that and the person dies, we say, oh, he led a full life. If the person died as a teenager, we say, oh, it was premature death. Why? Because we know he could have lived longer, he could have gone, you know, ahead. There were, there were more he didn't even give birth. He didn't even have any child. And he died. So, oh, it's, we are sorry because he's, he, he died prematurely. If somebody becomes pregnant as a teenager, we are all sorry. So, oh, he got pregnant prematurely. Because we, we know that in the normal, in normal, under normal circumstance, you must, you, you must get pregnant at the stage of contribution. Not stage of discovery. Because she was not ready for the pregnancy. So we all lament and bemoan and we all are very sad because the person got pregnant as a teenager. In the same way, God has expectations for us in the spirit. When we become born again, the Bible, the Bible uses five Greek words to describe our uh, stage-by-stage -stage development. And I'm going to use those Greek words and explain to you and let you know what every one of them entails. The first word is First Peter 2.2 2. When you become born again you are a newborn baby. Newborn baby. 
First Peter 2 verse 2. Newborn baby. The Greek word is brephos. Brephos. B-R-E-P-H-O-S. Brephos. First Peter 2 2. It says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now, this is referring to people who have been born again fresh. They are newborn babes can be compared to babies who have just been born. Day old babies. There's no difference between them and an animal. The only difference is that this is a human being, this is an animal, but they don't, they don't know what, what's going on in the environment. I mean, they, they, are, they are not conscious of what is going on. They, I mean, they cannot understand, interpret what is going on in the environment. But they have life. There are people like that. They are born again all right, but they are fresh babies in the Lord. Very, very fresh. Fresh babies. They have been born of the word of truth, but they need to grow. You will see that these people, if you don't take care, you will not see that they are born again. Because even though they are born again, they are just like the unbeliever. The newborn babes, they are, that's why it takes a lot of love and encouragement to help them to grow. If you don't take care, you can easily offend them and they can easily go back to the world. Because even though they have life, they are still like unbelievers. And they need to be taught and to be fed the word of God so that they can grow out of that immat- immaturity. That is why in the parable of the, of the, of the test and the wheat, Jesus Christ said, don't uproot the, the test now, lest you also uproot some of the wheat. Because at a certain age, certain stage, the wheat and the tear, they are alike. Why? Because it is only the fruit that will differentiate between the wheat and the tear. It's like planting banana and plantain. At the point, banana and plantain are the same. They, are, they look alike. You can't you can differentiate. So if you want to uproot the bananas, you may end up uprooting some plantain. Hello? Because their deeds are the same. He has come into the Lord fresh. He still has his old mentality. The same way he used to think in the world, he is thinking the same thing. The same sins he was committing in the world is committing the same sins because he's a fresh baby. And we need to have mature people in the Lord who can handle fresh babies. Otherwise, we may easily offend them and we may easily send them back to the world. And we may easily drive them away from the church. But if we have mature people in the church who have also who, who were once, in, one, one, once upon a time fresh babies and they grew out of immaturity, then they were able to help those, those fresh babies. So, there's no difference between them and the unbelievers. They are still, you know, struggling with um, um, uh, works of darkness. The Bible says we must repent from dead works. These brephos, they are, they are still exhibiting dead works, even though they are in the church, and even though they are born again. Now, what, what happens is that they should not stay there. They should not stay there. They should, they should grow. And they should have the environment to grow. Now, Brefos is Gilgal. It's a place where you have just been born. You are, you are in Gilgal. You have just been born. And, 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 and the word of truth is what gives you the new birth. You know. But God will give you systematic foundation. Block upon block foundation so that you can grow from the Brefos stage into the next stage. If you don't grow, you see, God measures growth by the amount of light that has come to you. Not by your duration. Not by the amount of time you've spent in the church. There are many people who have spent years in the church, but they are are not growing. And there are others also who come into the Lord within a short time they are growing. It depends on how you take advantage of the opportunity that God gives you. The light that God gives you. There are three things that will ensure your growth. The rain, the light, and the heat. God gives you the rain in a form of preaching and teaching. He gives you light in a form of illumination and insight, revelation. And then he gives you heat in a form of circumstances that you go through where you can apply what you have been been taught, what you have seen in the spirit. Then growth will come. So these refers, what they need 
at this stage of their life is foundational doctrines. We, we, we call it systematic delivery of apostolic doctrine. Delivery of apostolic doctrine. Systematic delivery of apostolic teaching. And they, and, and, and he said, he said in, uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, he said, let me read it. Acts 2, 42. They continue steadfastly. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayer. What I mean by apostolic doctrine, I'm talking about foundational doctrines of the faith. They need to be taught the foundations of the Christian faith. They need monitoring and close marking. So, those at the before stage, they need follow up. They need to be followed up. They need to be, you know, you know, you know, little children, I mean, uh, babies. Babies are said that if you, the one who gave birth to the baby, you leave the baby to feed itself, it will die. If you leave him on his own, he will die. So, it is a responsibility of the parent. Everything the baby needs is on the mother, on the parent. The parent must supply everything the baby needs. Make sure the baby is comfortable. You must even interpret the baby's language. Sometimes he doesn't even know what he needs. But you must interpret for him and, 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 and you, must, you must understand the baby. The baby cannot speak. Cannot express himself. Cannot speak and tell you that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having a problem with, with digestion. But you must be able to discern and know and think for the baby because he cannot think for himself. This is a time they need a lot of encouragement. Somebody who is born again, fresh. If you don't attend a funeral, the person can, can go back to the world. There are people like that in the church. You don't attend their funeral. Maybe they lost a loved one. You didn't attend their funeral. They can go back to the world. So they need pastoral care. This is where pastors come in. Where pastors must give them close marking, you know, help them, you know, even sometimes with their physical lives, everything about their life. Because they need close marking. This time, they need deliverance from evil spirits, from dead works. You see, at Gilgal, that was when the reproach of Egypt was rolled away. That was when God circumcised them. So, at that stage, that is where the person needs deliverance. There are some people, you know, as soon as they, they are born again, they still need to be delivered from certain spirits so that they can be free and strong to grow. Because there are certain spirits that may be following them. They may be hindering them from growing. So, they, they need teaching. They need feeding. They need caring. They need prayer. You have to pray for them, visit them, counsel them, deliver them, Make sure they are filled with the Holy Ghost because they are at the first stage. The first. Hallelujah. Now, at this stage, you identify them by their character traits. Like, they speak like worldly people. They, they, they listen to worldly songs. They are addicted. I mean, the same thing that the worldly people are doing, you will find the same. That's why, that's why if you don't take care, you may condemn them. But you must know that it is only a matter of time and they will outgrow those negative patterns. Hallelujah. The second stage is the stage where you become a young child. A young child. The Greek word is nepeos. Nepeos. N-E-P-I-O-S. N-E-P-I-O-S. Nepeos. That is a young child. An infant, a minor. This stage is the second stage of development in a cycle of life. Where you have become a young child. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, the word that is used as babes is the word uh, nepeos, young child. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to canal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. 
And even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there are envy and strife and division among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos. Are you not carnal? You see, let's differentiate between a babe and a carnal person. The babe will exhibit character traits of, ch- of, of, of a child or a young child. And it's normal. But a carnal person is a person who by reason of time should have grown beyond the stage of the pearls. But he is still exhibiting those tendencies. Then he's a, he's a carnal Christian. He's not growing. But for a babe, you don't expect a young child to behave in a matured way like an adult. So there are certain character traits that go with being a young child. But when by reason of time and by reason of the things that God has released to you, you are still exhibiting those tendencies, then the Bible says you are carnal. So Paul said that some of they, they were babes, all right, but some were also carnal because they were not growing. So Nepos, this stage is a stage of battle where you are introduced to the house of God. Where you are being integrated into God's building, God's house. Where you are introduced to the word of grace. Acts 20 verse 32, it says, I commend you to the Lord and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. So, God introduce you to the word of grace at this stage so that you can be built up. You can be strong. You need the word of grace at that level to build you up. You need to know about the kindness of God. About the mercy of God. About the love of God. Because, you see, when you come to this stage, all you need is that you must be you must be placed in relationship with your father. So, the Holy Spirit will begin to teach you to call God Father. He will begin to teach you to call fellow believers brothers. You will learn relationship in Bethel. You will learn about the love of God that is a father. You can come boldly to him anytime. Uh, he will forgive you when you sin. You know, when you, if you, if you sin and you confess, he will forgive you. He has already accepted you. You don't need anything for him to accept you. He has made you righteous in Jesus Christ. And you have become his righteousness. And you don't need anything to be added to it. That is, that, that is the level that God gives you the word of grace. So that you will be strong. It's that level that he assures you of your salvation. That your salvation is not based on your performance. That it is based on the finished work of Christ. You need that assurance and that understanding at this level. Otherwise, you will not grow. So the word of grace is released at that level of the Nepals. The Nepals is introduced to the church life. The church, the body of Christ, the local church, that is where we grow to know about fellowship. The, the essence of fellowship. The importance of belonging to a local family. All these things are taught. You are under authority. You are being trained. You are being taught. You are being fed with the word. And you are growing from state to state. Now, then the pearls, you can, you can also go to um, Galatians 4 1. It says, The hair, for as long as he remains a child, differed not from a slave, though he be master of all. The word child is the word in the pearls. He's, he's the heir to the throne, but he's a young child. So he cannot access the throne. He cannot really lay hold on the throne because he's a young child. He's placed under tutors and governors. He's being trained. He's in the pearls. Now, let me give you some character traits of the pearls. Jealousy and envy and strife. These things are common with young children. You find young children who are exhibiting jealousy and strife. It's also a trait of carnal believers. People who are supposed to have grown, but they haven't grown. And they are still exhibiting these tendencies of jealousy, like the Corinthian church. Paul said, for whilst there is 
uh, uh, strive and envy amongst you. Are you not carnal? Are you not behaving like mere men? Are you not behaving like children and babies? Young children. They are jealousy, envy, strife is there. Number two, idolizing men of God. You will find it in the pearls. They idolize men of God. And for Paul, and for Apollos, and for Cephas. And they, 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 they turn men of God into football stars who have fan clubs. I'm a fan of this person. I'm a fan of that person. That is, that is, it's a stage. It's normal, but it's a stage. It's the pearls. The pearls. It's, it's, it's a stage of, 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 of being a child in the Lord. Because they are not thinking about God using them. They are thinking about, hey, this man is powerful. They, when they will hear about this man has come to town, then they will run and go. Why? He's powerful. I'm going, I'm going to give him my, 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 my request. They hear of this new man of God in town, they run. Because they are Nepals. They are young children. They have not grown yet. Number three, the tendency to run after new doctrine. In Ephesians 4.14, the Bible says that he gave the fivefold ministry that the church will be edified. And the reason that he gave is that he said that we should no longer be children, Nepals, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Nepals have the tendency to run after every doctrine. And, but they don't have the maturity to discern between good doctrine and wrong doctrine. So they just run after everything that excites them. You see, young children, they are motivated by two things. Pain and pleasure. Anything that will give a child pleasure, he will follow. That is why some people can deceive them with toughies. If you want to steal a child, you can, you can give the child toughies. You know, I remember once when I was teaching Sunday school, there was this boy who the father was bringing him to church and he didn't want to come to the class. So what I did was, I took a toffee in my hand and I went and I said, follow me and I'll give you the toffee. And I, 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 I held the toffee behind me like this. And the child, I, I was moving. And the child followed me straight to the classroom. Because he's a child motivated by pleasure and pain. My children, when they are to take medicine, when they were very young, if you were giving them medicine, they would dip their finger into the medicine and taste it to see whether it's sweet. If it's not sweet, they will not take it. So they have to force them. If it's sweet, then they will take it. That is children. They are motivated by pleasure and pain. So anybody who is in the pearls, he, is, he moves on feelings. He moves on feelings. Where the thing will suit him, he will go. An adult will take medicine, whether it's bitter or not, because he knows the value of it. As an adult, if you have to go and receive an injection, even though it will pierce you, you will feel the pain, you will still go and endure. And you should, because you know the, the importance of the injection. But a child, he may be dying, but he will say, no, I will never receive injection because it will pain me. So you see children by, by, by people who are convenience driven, not commitment driven. They are, they, are, they are driven by convenience. If the thing is convenient to them, they will do it. Jesus Christ told Peter, he said, when you were a child, you tie your belt around your waist and you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you grow to become an adult, somebody will tie a belt around your waist and pull you to where you don't want to go. Pain and pleasure. They are, they, are, they are what motivate children. Then, the next thing is that they are not stable in their Christian lives. Nepals, young children, they are not stable in their Christian lives. Today they are up. Tomorrow they are down. It means they are, they, they, you are a child. Today you are up. Tomorrow you are down. Today you believe that God loves me. Tomorrow you say, oh, God doesn't love me. Something happens to you. Say, oh, God doesn't love me. It means you are not mature yet. Today you believe that uh, 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 God is for me. Tomorrow you say, oh, God is against me. You are still in the pearls. You are still a child. You are motivated by pain and pleasure. By convenience, not by commitment. So, up today, down today. 
Today, you are on top of issues. Tomorrow, issues are on top of you. It's, it's in a pious, in a pious lifestyle. They easily fall for tricks and deception. They are overwhelmed by the charisma of people. You see, Paul said, Ephesians said, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and the lying craftiness of deceitful men. So, the powers, children, young children, are easily deceived. They, they, are, they are easily deceived. They are overwhelmed by charisma. They don't, they don't have the discernment to really go beyond the showmanship and the facade to know what is behind. They only take what they see on the surface and they run with it. That is young children. They can be legalistic and dogmatic. Legalistic and dogmatic. Not working in love towards others who are of different opinion. If somebody is a baby Christian, a young child in the Lord, he is very dogmatic. He has seen the truth. But he cannot fellowship with people who have not even seen the truth. It takes maturity to see Christ in people of various denominations and various backgrounds, various emphasis and doctrine. But the Nepals doesn't see Christ in those people. The Nepals will look down on you because you don't speak in tongues. And he cannot fellowship with you if you don't speak, if you don't believe what I believe. I can't fellowship with you. That's children. You, you know, children, that's how they, they, they behave. The, the same character traits of natural children is the same that you find in spiritual children. And, 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 the, and the Bible is so clear about it. They cannot instruct others in the faith. They have not grown enough to teach other people in the faith, to instruct, to pass on their faith. They can't. Because they are still, they are still babes. They are still under, they, they can't impart their faith. Or, or instruct people in the faith. They are at the Nepal's level. Now, they speak before they think. They speak before they think. In First Corinthians 13, Paul says something, and you know, this morning I saw something I've never seen before. First Corinthians 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. He said when I was a child, he spoke like a child. He spoke before he understood, before he thought. But when you're a mature person, you would think, understand before you speak. So when you were a child, you will speak before you understand, before you think. And that is the state, that is the stage of Nepal. They speak before they think. So you find a lot of presumption in the pearls. When I say presumption, you know, the difference between faith, presumption, and foolishness. Some, some of the things that we, we, we think is faith, it is either presumption or foolishness. Presumption is when you presume to know. When you, sometimes you pre, we step ahead of God is presumption. Faith is when we, when we see, we hear from God and we act. Presumption is when we haven't heard from God and we are presuming, we are assuming, we are jumping into conclusion. Sometimes the difference between um, spirituality, uh, superstition, and stupidity. Some of the things that we call spirituality, they are actually stupidity. Not spirituality. Some are superstition. Spirituality. So, at the Nepal's level, we can't discriminate between superstition and spirituality, stupidity and spirituality. Let me give you one example of stupidity. <laughs> you know, sometimes we can make that mistake. If we have not grown into maturity to discern between good and evil, we can we can we can mistake stupidity for spirituality. And most of the things that we say by faith, by faith, by faith, some of them, they are not by faith. Some of them, they are, they are actually bordering on stupidity, not faith. 
Any faith that makes you irresponsible and makes and, 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 and doesn't show you the part you must play is a reckless faith. It's not Bible faith. Bible faith, there's a part you play. You take the word and you act on the word. You believe God has a part to play. You must also play your part. Your part is to believe the word and act on the word even though you have not seen it. That is faith. So you cannot say by faith I'm supposed to read this portion of land by faith. By tomorrow morning the Holy Spirit should read it. That is not faith. It's not faith. Anybody can take a journey into a far country. But Abraham's journey was by faith. Why? Because God asked him to travel without knowing where he was going. You can take your bag and say, I'm going, I'm traveling. Say, where are you going? I don't know where I'm going. I'm just going by faith. Or I'm traveling. No, that's not faith. Abraham's story was faith because God said, go to a land I will show you. And he left his father's house not knowing where he was going, but because God has spoken to me that go to where I'm going to show you. He just took his bag and was going. That is faith. You can decide to walk on water and go to the deep sea, middle of the sea, and step out and walk on water. It will not be by faith. The proof that you by faith is that when you step on the water, it will not sink. You will not sink. But Peter walked on water at least for some few minutes because Jesus said, come. And because Jesus said, come, he responded to God's word and that is faith. He said, come. And he stepped out and he began to walk on water. But who, you, who, who has told you to come? Nobody has told you to come. So you see, you see that you attempt to walk on water and then you will get drowned. Then we we'll, we'll blame it on God that God's word is not true because he said greater words shall you do. If he said greater words, then why couldn't you walk on water? It means you are mistaking presumption for faith and foolishness for faith. I remember those days in the 80s. People would just go and stand at Georgia Hotel or any other place. I claim it by faith. Somebody can come and stand by your car. Lay hands on the car and say, I claim this car by faith. I mean, that was in the realm of Nepal. I mean, it was presumption. There was this driver that my, my father had. When he sits in the car, he was a Christian brother too. When he sits in the car, he will not open the bonnet and, and fill the tank, the, the radiator with water. He will just say, Holy Ghost, fill it in Jesus' name. Then he will go. Then he, the car broke down. It was actually a machine. The machine broke down. Got spot. So after investigation, then he confessed that he was trying to exercise his faith. So instead of opening the, the bonnet and pouring water into the radiator, he will not do it. Holy Ghost should do it for you. He will not. That, that is a reckless faith. Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost doesn't work that way. If you have checked the Bible, the supernatural, God doesn't waste the supernatural. And the supernatural is always linked to something natural. To the extent that even for Elijah to prophesy to a widow of Zarephath, he said, you must have something in your house. Elijah could have said, go. When you get to your house, you will find money all over the place. Take the money, go and pay your debt, and then leave on the rest. But he said, no. What do you have in your house? And she said, I have just a pot of oil. He said, okay, you have something. At least I can work with it. Go, shut the door. Borrow vessels. And begin to pour the oil in the vessels. And they began to pour. And the, the oil was, was never finished till the vessels got finished. That is fake. So sometimes we are easily deceived by people who are giving us magic instead of miracle because we are in the pearls. Because we think a miracle is something that suspends process. No, a miracle will speed up process, but it will never suspend process. Look at how God performed miracles in the Bible. Even the miracle of the part of the Red Sea, it wasn't instant, it was 
an all night operation that parted the Red Sea. That should tell us something about God. That is why Jesus Christ said, to throw myself down from the, from the top of the temple, that God will allow angels to catch me. It's not faith, it's foolishness. Stupidity of the highest order. For me to stand and throw myself and say, angels catch me. <laughs> and you will die before your time. <laughs> and as I, as I go along, you will see that you will get to a point where some loss of nature can be suspended. But if you are in God there, don't be presumptuous. Otherwise, you can die before your time. Now, they are not faithful in basic things. They are not stable. Let me use the word stable. They are not stable in basic things like personal prayer. Pain of time, service, etc. They are not, they are not stable. Then the pearls, they have not they, they have not come to a point where they know the value of spending time with God. So they see it as religion. That if I don't do my quiet time, maybe pastor will call me and ask me. Or maybe I will feel guilty. Nepal, if they don't read the Bible, they feel guilty. But when you grow, you feel hungry. When you grow, it is your hunger that will drive you to the Bible, not the sense of guilt. So at this stage, we play church and we play religion. It is okay. It is okay if we are at that stage. But if by reason of time and exposure, God wants you to go to the next thing, you are still there. It means you are carnal. You are not yet, you are not just a baby, you're a young child, you are being becoming carnal. And they are selfish in their approach to things. Children are naturally selfish. Naturally selfish. Something that you are giving them, for them to give them back to you is a problem. You gave it to them, but they can't give it back to you. It's a, because they are naturally self-centered. The, the more we grow, the less selfish we become. That is why if a teenager gives birth, it's a disaster. Because the teenager has not grown to a point where she, she can be naturally selfless to get, take care of a child. So she has given birth all right, but she lost the maturity and the selflessness. There was one teenager who gave birth. She will give the child valium. For the child to sleep so that she can go out and hang out with friends. She wants, she wants to enjoy herself. And she has gone to give birth to this child. And she thinks this child is, is a distraction to her. So she will give the child valium, sleeping tablet. And the child will sleep. Then she will leave the child in the room, go and hang out with her friends. That's a typical example of somebody who was giving birth but who is not mature. So, the fact that you have brought somebody to Christ doesn't make you a father. The fact that you have converted somebody doesn't make you a father. Because a teenager can give birth to a child. It doesn't make him have the qualities of a father. He's still selfish. He cannot even sacrifice for the children. Parents can go hungry and, and, and just to feed their children. So, maturity is not just a matter of producing. You can produce at 15 years, you can give birth. 12 years, you can give birth. But you, you, you don't have what it takes to take care of the child. So, it doesn't make you, you are a father by biological fact. But you will become an irresponsible father because you have not grown in maturity to handle the child or to or raise the child. So, Nepal's are selfish. When you are in a post state, your prayer is self-centered. God, 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 God cannot get you to pray apostolic kingdom prayers. Your prayer, all your prayer are self-centered. And it's, it's, it's normal. But 
then as you go to the next stage and the next stage, you will see that you are becoming less and less selfish in prayer. Because the Nepal doesn't see the need for intercession. He doesn't see why he must pray for other people, spend his time. He is praying for power. He, he, he is praying for favor from God, open door from God. He doesn't know why you should pray for some people. And he doesn't even know why you should go to the, 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 the Lord and ask God, what do you want me to pray for? Well, he is coming with this, with this list. So, in this stage, at this stage, what the Nepals need is re-instruction of basic doctrines. A systematic teaching of the word of grace is still needed. The Nepals must be taught about the fruit of the spirit to build character. You see, the main character issue of human being is selfishness. When they ate the tree of knowledge, they looked at themselves. That was when selfishness was born. So, the goal of, of the Holy Spirit, his role, is to help us grow out of selfishness. So, the fruit of maturity is actually the opposite of selfishness. That's why the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love is not self-centered. Love is God-centered. Love will result into sacrifice because of God. So, the Nepal must be, must be taught about love and fellowship. Living with people, among people. It's a problem. You see, when the reason why God puts us in the church is to teach us how to live because you see how to live with people because you see the issue is not about you the issue is we all so we all arrive at the unity of faith at the knowledge of the son of God to the full measure of the stature of Christ the thing is to we all not you alone we all it takes a mature person to understand that we all. He said that you may be able to comprehend, comprehend all saints. Let me read that to you. Ephesians chapter um, 3. He was saying that Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17 verse 16 that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being grounded, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is their width and length and depth and height. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Comprehend with all saints so at this stage, God teaches you how to comprehend with all saints. How to grow with other saints. Grow, grow in the body. That is why the Corinthians had a problem. At, at that stage of the Nepals, they were exhibiting spiritual gifts, but there was no love. So the spiritual gifts were exercised in a selfish, uh, selfish way. Let me tell you, even brefos, brefos, if they are rightly taught, they can exercise spiritual gifts. Nepals, they can cast out demons and exercise spiritual gifts. Nepals. But because of lack of maturity, if they don't learn to grow in love, the use of the spiritual gift, they will use the spiritual gift for entertainment. They will use them as toys, not as tools. That is, that is why Paul, Paul stressed on love in 1 Corinthians. When he touched on spiritual gifts chapter 12, he sandwiched chapter 12 chapter 14, which was 13, which was about love. 
So they will know that it takes love to operate the gifts in God's way. So he said, seek the best gifts and yet I show you a more excellent way. Then 13, he said, if I have all the gifts of, of faith to move mountains and I have no love, I'm nothing. If I have the gift of understanding mysteries, I have no love, I'm nothing. He said, if I can speak with the tongues of men, I have no love, I'm nothing. What was he doing? He was praying to tell her, look, all the gifts of the spirit, if you don't grow in love, you are nothing before God. You, you are just making noise before God. So the whole book of 1 Corinthians is milk. Paul didn't, couldn't feed them with solid food. He only gave them milk. Settling dispute. Don't take your brother to court. Chapter 6. Chapter, chapter 4. Chapter 4. He was talking about, they were saying, eh, eh, Apollos is more anointed than Paul. And Paul said, look, this is a childish thing. Apollos and I, we are co-laborers. He said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So it's not about Apollos or about Paul. But the pearls, that's how they behave. Oh, this one is anointed. Look, I'm anointed. I'm anointed. I'm anointed more than you. And so Paul said, Paul said, what do you have that you didn't receive? And if you receive, why do you post as if you didn't receive it? He was addressing the post. So he was stressing that, look, you, you should not be puffed up because of your anointing. Then he got to a point, he said, don't be puffed up because of your knowledge. Chapter 8. He said, we all know that we don't eat food sacrifice to idol, but knowledge puffs up, but, but love edifies. He was stressing on love. Love. Why? Because they were still in the pills. Hallelujah. So, if you are always comparing yourself with somebody, it means you have not, you have not, you have not grown beyond the pills. If you are always comparing, see my macho. See my, see my macho. See my macho. <laughs> that, that's how children behave. And and the worst of it is all that they will look at somebody. You see, it's like comparing apples and oranges, or banana and, and and oranges. When you grow, you will see that you you are just a minute part of a bigger picture. You will see that the body doesn't rise and fall with you. You are just a part. So you will just come and do your part and allow others to do their part. And God will give an increase. You know, somebody can be in the pearls and the person can be leading the church because he has, he has, he, he has a gift. You think the pearls can, they can, they can be pastors. That's why I'm saying that going to Bible school doesn't make qualify you to be a pastor per se unless you have also grown you know like you've grown uh, then but just because I know people who came born again within a short time they went to Bible school and they came out and we were calling them reverence reverend because they and they went for a short course like six months one year and we we're calling them reverend and they were, were, were wearing clerical and now, now, some of them, they are no longer even found in the ministry, nor in the faith. I said, I know some. Because they are not matured, they were still in the pearls, and, and so they were using the clerical just as a cover-up. A lot of insecurity, a lot of fighting, a lot of backbiting, a lot of gossip, a lot of envy, strife, all these things, they are characteristics of Nepal. But you will find them in people who are even leading congregations. So the next stage. So we are growing. This one is Bethel. Where the house of God. That's when if, if, if you skip Bethel, you do a lot of damage to your Christian life. That's why I always say that everybody must have must, 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 must be discipled. You must, you must be taught. You must be nurtured. Paul said, 
uh, that you are somebody who has been nourished up with the words of truth. Nurtured. Not just, you know, I just became, became a Christian and I'm just copying what others are doing. No. You have, you have, you have gone through discipleship. You have been taught. You have been, you have, you have, you have been trained with the word of truth. And it takes place in the body of Christ, in the local church. That's where you learn discipline, you learn submission, you learn, you, I mean, you, you, you learn to grow. That's where you, you even learn to love. You even learn to love in the church. Because that is where people will step on your toes and you begin to learn how to love. How to forgive, overlook an offense. We learn all those things in this stage. That is why it is very vital to have a healthy fellowship life as a Christian. Don't be a lone ranger. Don't be somebody who says, I will buy the books and stay at home. And prepare for the exams. You must be part of a, a thriving fellowship. Where you, you, you get to grow with other people. Because all these things, there are people, I'm telling you, there are people who are preaching. They were never taught. They were never taught. Nobody sat them down to teach them. And because of gifts and charisma, they can preach up a storm. But you will see gaps. Because there's no growth process. There's no maturity. The next stage is a youth or a young man. And you see all these stages, you find them uh, first, first John. John was mentioning those stages. First John 2. First John 2, verse 12. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. You see, little children, he's writing to you about your sins are forgiven you. Uh, the blood of Jesus Christ has washed away your sins. And you are no longer guilty before God. You are righteous. These are for little children. They need that assurance to know that Jesus Christ has forgiven my sins. And they also need to be told that, look, if you sin, you must confess and he will forgive you. These are for little children. He said, I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. You see, from the beginning. Talking about a journey. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. Then he said, I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. You see, the, 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 the childhood state, you are, you, you are being trained to call God daddy. That's why I say, the Holy Spirit, Christ, Abba, Father, because he wants you to know that God is your real father. Because you, you had a stepfather, the devil, before you came born again, the devil was your father. And now, it's like, yeah, you, yeah, God has delivered you from the, from him and he has brought you to himself. So he's now your father. But you have been taught to accept him as a father. So that there will be no inferiority complaint when you stand before your father. The, all these are foundational teachings that the believer must, must get, even at the childhood stage. These are not for, these are not solid food. These, these are milk of the word. To know that God is my father and he loves me unconditionally. That his love for me is not performance related. I don't have to do anything to earn his love. He loved me even before I was born again. The child needs that assurance. I've written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I've written to you young men because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you and you overcome the wicked one. So the next stage is the stage of the young man. That is Jericho. The Greek word is Nianiskos. Young man, Nianiskos. Nianiskos. This is a place where Christianity is uh, very, very sweet and slippery. Because at this time, you are introduced to your rights and your privileges and then your responsibilities. Nianisco, they know the word. He said, 
young men, the word abides in you. You are not talking about literal young men. Talking about spiritual young men, they know the word. Because this is the time that they are equal to the word of faith. Where they begin to know their rights and their privileges in the Lord. It's a time where he said, you overcome the devil. He said, you are, you are strong. The word of God abides in you. And you overcome the wicked one. He said that twice. Now, that goes beyond casting out devils. Casting out devils, even Nepals can cast out devils if they are bold enough. So, doing deliverance and casting out devils doesn't make you mature. Baby Christians can do that with anointing, with gifting. They can just cast out devils. But overcoming the devil, this one is talking about getting to a stage where the priest of this world comes to me and he has nothing in me. That's the story of our truth. That's near, near this school. So when he says overcoming the devil, it doesn't mean that they cast out devils. No, it means the devil comes to them and he finds nothing in them. It means 1 John 5.18. It says, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. But he who has been born of God keeps himself. And the wicked one does not touch him. It's a place of Nianiscus where you learn to keep yourself. That the devil cannot touch you. At this stage, you, you don't sin intentionally. I'm not saying you cannot sin. No. I'm saying at this stage, intentional sin is out. You don't sin intentionally. You sin by mistake. <laughs> because you are growing. He's established in apostolic doctrine. When I say apostolic, I mean foundation. Because apostles are foundation layers. So when I say apostolic, I mean foundational doctrine. He's established in apostolic doctrine. That's why I said, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' teachings. Because when you become born again, you need foundation to be laid in your life. The apostles are teachers. He has strong fellowship with believers. He knows his spiritual family, his place of planting, and he is growing. That is Nianiscus. Nianiscus they know that, know that this is my house. Um, Nepals, they don't, they don't have a house. Nepals are like, they can just go anywhere and they eat. You see, children, I, I know one woman who was saying that her children don't eat sugar. She has been training them with honey. Not knowing they have been going to their next house and anytime they, 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 they will go there, they will give them sugar and they will eat. So the woman thought that her children didn't know how to eat sugar, only honey, not knowing they were eating sugar, you know, every day. Because they are motivated by sweets, you know, pleasure. Just give them pleasure, they will, they will come. That is why that near this coast are not like that. Young men are not like that, even though they have not, they have not got to a last stage, but they are mature. At least they know they can difference between at least they can stand some some pain and they can overcome some pleasure. They can they, 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 they can know that oh this place, this house is not my house. Do you, do you know that when somebody is mature, the person respects boundaries, times and seasons. For instance, take children to somebody's house. They can just go to the person's bedroom. They'll just go. They, it, to them, it's just a bedroom. But you, the mature person, you will not just go to somebody's bedroom. You cannot just enter my house and go straight to my bedroom. But your child can do, the, can do that. When I see your child coming to my bedroom, I will not be surprised. When I see you, the adult, come to my house and straight up, come to my bedroom, I will be surprised. <laughs> I will be surprised. <laughs> yes. So Nianiscos, they know the house they belong to. Even if they go to another house, they know that I'm in another house. This, this is not my house. Because they know their plant, the, 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 the house of their planting. They don't just move from house to house, eating whatever is given them. 
today they, they, they will go here and they give them some doctrines through they will go here so they are confused today they go here so oh, jesus christ is an angel today they go here so oh, jesus lucifer is is also um, uh, going to be born again then they go here so oh, oh uh, you don't you need to confess your sin it, it's, it's wrong to confess your sin they, go here, they, they say look you have to confess your sin then they are confused stay at one place don't move from house to house you'll be confused so he's going to know and Nyaniskos now they can share their faith. They can share their faith. They, they become conscious of that. I must share my faith. I must share my faith. He's learning to use his giftings and growing in them. This is a time he's, he's, he's growing in his giftings. He's learning to use them. And, but it must also go with a corresponding uh, uh, growth in love. Otherwise, you become an imbalanced person. Strong in giftings, poor in love. So you use the, the gifts that are spread for toys. You use prophecy for entertainment and comedy. <laughs> you know, uh, if somebody can just bring you and come and put you here and say prophesy, you know, I, I I'm, I'm just coming to, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing you here, prophesy. Oh, we we have more time, so let's bring the prophet to come and prophesy. It's not for entertainment. It's not for entertainment. We have reduced these things to entertainment. That the reason why the prophet come and prophet is so that he will come and display the gift. People will know that he can know you and know that. That's, that's entertainment. If you are coming, you are coming to preach and teach the word. When you teach the word and you preach the word, then the gifts can flow. But you don't just come and say, oh, you, you, can you, you come and just stand there and, and just, just prophesy. Just prophesy. You know, somebody was telling me that, oh, the reason why we want to invite a prophet is so that the people will come. It's all immaturity. Immaturity. If you are using the prophetic because you, you want people to come, that's why, and you want to, to hear things. If people don't know the weight and responsibility that comes, you want you to hear prophecy. The thing is just exciting to hear things. You just you hear one prophecy and you, and you you start having battles. If God had not told you, then you don't have any problem. Now God has told you that I'm going to do this thing for you, and He said it in public, and the enemy too has heard it. So you just go and stand there. Oh, hey, I, I see you are going abroad. You are going, and then you you kneel down and you lie down. You you are happy. You, you go and you rest. The prophet said, I will go abroad. Somebody has hijacked that prophecy long time. You didn't know. Yeah. Because prophecy comes with work. Paul said, the prophets that have gone before you, that you might through them wage a good warfare. It comes with warfare. If God says it, then it means prepare for war, to fight it. If God said, go and take the land of Canaan, it means prepare for opposition. Was not God who said they should go and take the land? What, how God said it was as if the land was there and the keys have been given to them. They will get, just go and take them. He said, eh, I've given you from this border to this border, great river Euphrates, everywhere your feet will tread, I've given it to you. So you just get up and just go to AI, then you you, you step there and say, my feet are stepped here. I take it by faith. <laughs> In Jesus. <laughs> you, they, they will beat you and drive you away. Because he was saying, anywhere you are prepared to take your bow and arrow and fight, I will give it to you. Don't just receive prophecies and put them in frames. Frame them and hang them on your wall. No, receive them and go to work. Start praying. This word that you have said, God, you must do it. 
David said, what you have told me, you let it come to pass. When Nathan said, God says, I will make you a house and I will make you a, a this, this, he said, let what you have told your servant come to pass. In, in Psalm, Psalm um, 49, he said, the things that you have caused your servant to hope on, hope in, let it, them come to pass. It's prayer. So, let us not reduce the prophetic to, to games and to entertainment. That when we are bored, that the prophet will come and charge the atmosphere. It's not for entertainment. It's a serious business. Destinies are involved. People's destinies are on the line. We need the, the prophet to come with a, with a now word to release the atmosphere. It's not just a matter of just using the gifts. No. We need to come with a noun word. What we say, look, in the Bible, I don't know what I'm talking about. But in the Bible, when they said prophet in the New Testament, the reference was always to a word. Noun word that was brought on the scene, that released the atmosphere. That is why your prophetic is. The other one is bonus. The giftings, that one is bonus. Because let me tell you something. No matter how gifted you are, and you can see, you cannot minister to many people at the same time. So, if you are just using your gift, and he has a need, a need, a need, how many people can you minister to in a service? At most, 10 people or 20 people. Even that one, you don't even, you go for prophetic meetings, and the prophet will call this person, then he will waste about 30 minutes on the person. He will come and foster. Then they will clap. Then he will go. I go go. <laughs> Calling senior high. And, and he's, he's wasting 20 minutes. Meanwhile, the main reason why he called foster hasn't come. Maybe he needs some healing or deliverance. He hasn't, that hasn't come. Before he will go to this person. So if that's all you've got, and you are just a raw prophet. You are deficient. You must get to a point where you can come and release a word. And many people are liberated. Then these ones will be bonus. Just to show that God is omniscient. When it is only that one, it means that you have reduced the thing to toys. Not tools. But the gifts of the spirit, they are tools. They are not toys to be played with. You are introduced to the word of faith, the word of power, word of life. This is when you start using you, you, you start using the anointing. That's why I say young men, you are strong. It's the realm of the anointing. Where God puts an anointing on your life and your whole life changes. So at this stage, he is gaining strength over the flesh. I'm not saying he has gained strength. He's gaining strength. He's, he's gaining strength over the flesh. You see, the things that you, you could not overcome at the Nepal stage, at this stage, now he's, he's, he's able to overcome. Because you see, one of the signs of maturity is delay in gratification. Do you know why children wear their beds? They can't delay gratification. But an adult, who would be that show home for some time, at least you can endure for some time. An adult, you can wake up and go to the bathroom to urinate. But a child, we, we, they, they don't have self-control. So they will just urinate on their bed. It's a stage. When you grow, when you are 20 years and you are still doing it, then that one, it means there's a problem. That is when it, you may need prayer or help or something. But naturally, by a certain age, you outgrow all those things. So, children cannot delay gratification. They must have it now. Satisfied now. When you grow, you are able to put things in the future. So, when I say he's gaining strength over the flesh, that's what I mean. He's gaining strength over the flesh. There are certain things now he's able to overcome them. You see, if we don't get systematic delivery of apostolic doctrine, 
We are going to be thrust into positions and then we will be hollow. You will see people who are, God has given them certain platform and they are still struggling with certain things of the flesh. Because they did not take time to grow. Because it's a process. You will get to a point where you are gaining strength. This is where you will start praying some prayers. Pray for your inner man to be strengthened. Pray for self-control. Pray for strength. Because it's, 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 that is, it's, it's a young, young man's state. You know, somebody with a book called uh, Every Young Man's Battle. So, that, when you get to that place, you, you receive strength. And God is faithful that if you ask him at that stage, God will give you the strength. Don't wait till God, God has promoted you somewhere then you can't close your zip. That is why we have people who are in fivefold, suppose, supposedly in fivefold ministry, and they can't close their zip. You see that the person is not mature. I'm not, I'm not. When you say people are simply saying you are being legalistic, or, <laughs> we, are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are so funny. When we talk about holiness, they say you are being legalistic. That is funny. Check the Bible. Works in the New Testament. Works is part of it. The only difference is that in the Old Testament, works came before salvation or righteousness. In the New Testament, works come before, come after righteousness. When God has declared you righteous, then you must bear the fruit of righteousness. Check the Bible. Paul always was balanced. He told the Ephesian church, he said, you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. He said, you are, you are, you are, you, he has raised you together with Christ and you are in the heavenly place. Then he said, let him who stole steal no more. Do not lie. Let no fornication be named even once among you as saints. Neither filthiness or jesting or, or, or loose talking. Rather giving of thanks. That is Paul. He said that before he said, and finally my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of, of, of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Today, the armor of God, we want to put the armor of God, we want to chase the devil and, and, and take authority of our principalities. But we don't want to uh, live the life. And when you say, they, they, they say you are, you are talking about legality. When the Bible says legality, it's talking about the fact that you think your salvation is based on works. And in fact, the worst he was talking about in the Galatians is rituals, circumcision, animal sacrifice, not things like holiness and righteousness, not things like not committing fornication. Those things are not worse. Those are the lifestyle of the Christian. But the fruit of the spirit, self-control is in it. So here too, there's a growth in character. Okay. Now, at this stage, let me give you some of the things that... Um, at this stage, we, 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 we sometimes are, uh, they still ask. He thinks he has arrived. That's number one. At this stage, you may think you have arrived. You may think you have gone the full cycle because maybe um, this way you can, you, uh, uh, you can do something. You know, you are growing. You know, young people, young youth, we call some, we have something we call youthful exuberance. It is still also in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the spiritual sense. When you are young, you think that you must be able to fight every battle. And sometimes you may even see your, your leaders are slow. Because when you are young, you think everything should be instant. And you think you, you must be able to conquer everything. When you grow, you will know that you can only conquer certain things. You have your sphere of authority. That's all. Paul said, we don't pretend to over extend our measure of authority that Christ has measured for us. When you are young, you want to take the whole world for Christ. The whole world for Christ. When you are old, when you grow, you will see that you can't take the whole world for Christ. You will see that you will try to preach the gospel in Asia, but he will forbid you. He will say, no, don't go to Asia. When you are young, you, you, you tell you, go into all the world. Then you are fired up. He thinks 
no, no, he, he can become condemning, judgmental of others. The reason why that happens is because at this stage, you will see that you are growing. I mean, you will see some growth. So, if you can condemn other people and become judgmental and critical, pride, going beyond boundaries, they are all there. Okay. Now, let me, let me go to the last stage. This is the last stage. It's a complete man. Matured man. And the Greek word is teleos. T-E-L-I-O-S. Teleos. A matured man. A complete man. Teleos. When you are able to go through process and you get to this point, that's why the Bible says you are complete and entire. Lacking nothing. In James, he says, let perseverance have its complete work that you may be complete and entire. Uh, fair, uh, James chapter 1 verse 2. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This the where you become a full grown man. Second Timothy 3 verse 16. That the man of God may be perfect or mature, thoroughly furnished or equipped for every good work. Perfect, mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is where you are flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. You are flowing in the fruit of the Spirit. You are balanced. When we say spirituality, you are spiritual. You are spiritual. The spirituality is in twofold. twofold. Your relationship with the Holy Spirit. How you are growing in the fruit of the Spirit. How you are growing in the gift of the Spirit. Those two combined will make you a spiritual person. So, at this point, it's like every, you, have, you have been through the seasons of the Christian life. The various phases. Now, you have completed the process. You are now a matured man. This is the point where you can reproduce after your kind. This is the point where you can raise people from the scratch. You see, if we give you people and you are able to know the kind of food that you must give them from the babyhood stage to the grow, it means you have been, you have been, you have been there before. You have been taught. You, you, are, you, are, you have come to know the food that babies need. The food that Young, people, uh, young men, uh, 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 young children need, young men need, because we have been through the process. Character traits at this stage: knowledgeable, humble, and meek, like Christ. Wisdom, wisdom is also seen at this stage. This is where you are like Christ. You are like Christ. Sinners can come to you and they will not feel condemned. At the same time, they will live transformed. It is a stage where we call something dexterity. You are able to blend. You are flexible. Not in a negative sense, but in a positive sense. You are able to come low. Able to also go high. That's Christ. Zacchaeus, even Mary, or that woman could approach Christ to use her hair to wipe his feet. And the Pharisees didn't understand. But that was Jesus. He could embrace her. If I did, this is the point where, this is the point where you can, you, 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 you are neither um, legalistic nor lawless. It's a blend. Some people are legalistic. Others are lawless. Everything goes. But this is the point where you, you work the balance. You are not legalistic. You are not lawless also. You can restore people without condemning them.
is a place of maturity. And this is Jordan. This is Jordan. This is where you get to where you now know the Lord. You know the Lord. He can lead you with his eyes. You can do this. Then you get him. When you are young, he sometimes leads you with, you know, many other things. When you grow, he can just wink at you like this and you understand it. He said, I will guide you with my eyes. Psalm 38, I will guide you with my eyes. When you are young, he said, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this the way, walk here in it. When you grow, you, you have to look at his face. He will just guide you with his eye. And then you will get it. That is why when, 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 when you grow in the law, you don't only depend on prophecies. In fact, most prophecies you will get, you would have gotten them already in your spirit. It is those who are not grow, who are not mature who rely on prophets to hear God. You don't rely on a prophet to hear God. The prophet will come your way and confirm something or tell you something from God. Then you are you know how to relate to him. It's not that you are going to a prophet to seek to, for him to tell you your destiny. At this point, it's not like that. This is where ideally you must be in the fivefold. Ideally, it's a place of maturity. But unfortunately, many people are in a fivefold, supposedly, and they are not here. This is where you become a father. He said, the fathers, they have known him from the beginning. You have, you have been through the process. This is where you can say you are a father. I'm to, this is where you can father a daughter without messing, him up, messing her up. If you haven't got to this point, you don't qualify to father a daughter. I'm telling you. It, it, because it takes maturity to father a daughter as a man or to father a, to mother a son as a woman. <laughs> but especially man. If you can't control yourself and you want to father a daughter, you father a child. <laughs> Before you realize you have fathered a child through the daughter. <laughs> oh, you didn't get me. <laughs> now, uh, at this at this time, you get what I call a meek and a quiet spirit. When I say meek and quiet, I don't. I'm not saying you don't talk. You are at rest. Your spirit is quiet. You are at rest. Jesus said, learn of me for I am meek and humble in heart. You are at rest. There is no competition in you. There is no strife. There is no insecurity. You are at rest. There is no anxiety. You are at rest. Even in the midst of storms, you are at rest. It means you are mature. Even in the midst of opposition, you are at rest. Even in the midst of rejection, you are at rest. This is a point you get to where neither praise nor condemnation affect you. They can heap praises on you. You are not affected. They can criticize you. You are not affected. Why? You have made yourself of no reputation. This is where you can lay aside your garment and wash the feet of the disciples. That Jesus did. This is where you can Go after the sheep, risking your life, taking the sheep from the from the mouth of the lion, risking your life because you are mature. This is where you can sacrifice everything for the sake of him who called you. You are mature. This is where 
your battle is not the battle of the flesh. It's a battle of the will. You see, in Nianisco, the battle is primarily with the flesh. How to get this body to submit to me? How to control this body? How to control these feelings? But when you get to tell you, your battle is not how to control. You see, Jesus Christ, when he was in Gethsemane, his battle was not how to control my flesh. He was going through a battle, but the battle was how to place my will under God's will. He was going through a battle, but it wasn't a battle of the flesh, it was a battle of the will. That is the most difficult battle. How to place your will under God's will. Finally, let me, let me cut it short. When you get to this stage, you now qualify to be put on the road to sonship. In fact, sonship is the highest stage. All these five stages, they prepare you for sonship. So, the matured person here is now a candidate for sonship. The ones the Christian is waiting for, the manifestation of the sons. You cannot be a son if you have not gone through these stages to become a telios. Because that's why, that's why when, when God starts with you, when you get to this place, God will begin to now come to you and reveal to you, make demands on you. And he is leading you into sonship. For sonship, you get to sonship, it's a place of dominion. And that is a place where we, we must all, when we get there, then we can say that we have, we have completed the cycle. That's a place God wants us to get to the final place where you become a son. A son doesn't mean a young child. A son is somebody who is a full grown man who is now like the son. Just like Jesus. In everything. Just like Jesus. Then you are, and at that, at that point we don't talk about gifts of the spirit. We talk about the spirit, seven spirits of God. At that point, we don't talk about um, just reading the Bible. We talk about receiving revelation. You see, actually, actually, the, the creation is waiting for the sons. And the creation is waiting when the sons take their place. I will talk about the man-child company. You understand that there's a man-child company. Those are the ones who are the overcomers. In Revelation, he said, those who overcome, I will give them this. They have access to the hidden manner. Access to all those things. It's a man-child company. And, and, and God wants to raise people into sonship. That is why he puts you on the path of righteousness. When you get to tell us, you are introduced to the word of righteousness. And the word of Christ. The two highest forms of the word of God. Word of righteousness and the word of Christ. It's not just the gift of righteousness, but the word. He leads me on the path of righteousness. That's where he puts you on the path of righteousness. For his name's sake, not for your sake. At first, the Lord is your shepherd. I shall not want. That is um, maybe um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Nepal's is my shepherd, I shall not want the pearls. He makes me lie down in green pastures. The pearls. He restores my soul. The pearls. All these things he does for you. He's your shepherd. He leads me to still waters. Nianiscus. He, he leads you to still waters. Then all of a sudden, he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Now he's leading you somewhere you don't want to go. Not for your sake, but for his name's sake. We call it paths of righteousness. After that, he said, Ye do, I walk through. You know, the, the shepherd is now leading the sheep through the valley. 
of the shadow of death. And he has only two things for him. Your staff and your rod. This is where he spanks you. And he directs you. He speaks to you sternly. But after that, through that, then he brings you to a place where he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Now, your cup is running over. He anoints your head. Now, your cup is running over. That is where goodness and mercy, they now follow you. You don't chase them. At that point, they follow you. I had a dream this morning. Let me finish with the dream. In the dream, I was in a car with one man of God in Africa here. And as we were going, people stopped us. And I saw somebody with a gun, like an arm robber, coming towards the car. So I quickly locked all the doors. And I was driving. He was sitting by me. When I locked the door, the arm robber came. Then I rolled the, 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 was the, the glass up. So he came and he was knocking. Pa, pa, pa. Then immediately the man of God rolled the thing down. And I was afraid. Because when I saw him coming, but he came and he was banging on the on the on the uh, what, do you, what what is that? The window. <laughs> and immediately the man of God rolled down the glass. And he took the gang like this. The, the, the arm robber was very hefty. He he took the gun like this and bent it down like that. And then he said, I dare you to shoot. <laughs> and then the young brother was just standing there. Then he told me, drive on. Hey. That was a demonstration of sonship. If you are not there, if you try, you will be killed. Because sons Display authority and dominion over the elements. Over fire, over wind, over water. So the bullet that is coming, is coming with fire. But the sun can break the speed. And like I, I shoot you, pow, then it breaks. It doesn't get to you. <laughs> and that man of God that I saw, that is what all that he does. I'm Robert, see him and they, they run away. <laughs> So one day I was reading his book. He said he was in traffic. Am Roberts had hijacked the place. Then he got down from the car. The driver said, Papa, where are you going? He said, Wait for me. Then he went to where the Am Roberts were. Then he said, Give me the gun. <laughs> then he took their gun from their hand and he said, Go back into the bush. And they went. He's a son. <laughs> and and I and as if God, God was showing me the picture of a son because of this message. And I am, and yes, he was showing me the picture of a typical, a typical son who is walking in dominion, controlling force of nature and force of darkness. He is not into deliverance, like, come out, come out, quick. No, no, he's not. He enters a place, the demons will run away. That's, that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for deliverance. Okay, I'm not saying it's not good, though. It's good. But me, personally, I'm not, I'm not, now, I'm not so much excited about, come out! Then, you know, then, uh, uh, touch! And I'm not so much excited. Now, I want to enter a place. As soon as I enter the room, tumors will disappear. Just by entering the room, blind eyes will start seeing. That is what I want. That is what I'm going after. That's the place of sonship. I'm not there yet, but I'll get there. Because I've set my eyes to that place. That this is where I want to get to. Not the place of, I'm not saying it's not good. Though. At least, we, not, we, like, it's good. You know, we enjoy those things. You know, I enjoy those things. Yeah. But now, I'm saying that I'm, I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward. I'm not just satisfied with getting a word of knowledge. Satisfied with bringing a word that will change somebody's life forever. One word that will transform somebody's life forever. Forever. This man of God I'm talking about, he doesn't, he doesn't pray for people. He will just come and stand there just preaching the word. Just declaration. Every problem, 
in your finances from today, it dies. <laughs> then he said, Amen. Then you will hear testimonies. Testimonies. He has a book called Signs and Wonders. Big book full of testimonies. His books. People read his books. And barrenness disappeared. I'm telling you, madness. Somebody was mad. And he said, put him in my car. He didn't pray for him. He said, put him in my back seat. Let me see the demon that will follow him to my car. He got into the car. He slept. And, and today, the person is a lawyer. That mad person is a lawyer. <laughs> I'm talking about sonship. He has got into that, that, that point. That is what Jesus Christ entered the room and the demon started screaming. Just run away. We have to shout and struggle with that. Some of them have to even beat them physically. Before the demons will finally give, give him. We are tired of that. I'm, I, I'm tired. I want to go to another level. Where I will just say, come on, come on, come on. I was watching Pastor Chris. And he was doing healing line. Then he got to a, a, a point. You know, he, he had not got into the woman. Who, the demon said, we won't go. We won't go. And he was looking at Joseph. <laughs> he said, he said, then, oh, he was gone. That is a son. Commanding presence. Hey, let's be on our feet. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, we, are, we have somewhere to go. And we will get there, I'm telling you. If we don't give up, we will get there. So, so I see that thing. I will never, I will never claim I've arrived. Till I get to a point where I see those things. I will never claim I've arrived. I will always press on till I get to that point. Where you see, people have been assigned to come and kill you. And they see you and they fall down. Just seeing you. They, they have their weapons, their guns. You don't speak. They just see you. Just see you. They just fall down. I, I'm talking about preaching. While Peter yes spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them. I'm talking about just preaching and drag out this have been delivered. Just preaching. You haven't even laid hands. Just preaching. Cripples are walking. Just preaching. The blind are seeing. Just preaching. I was watching somebody, some one, one man of God, I was watching him. He was just preaching. Just preaching. And people were getting out of wheelchairs. Just preaching. So if you let, I mean, if you scream, and people get out, you shouldn't be excited. Somebody was just preaching. Somebody was just passing by. His shadow was raising the dead. Let's begin to pray. Wherever you are, oh God, help me to move to the next level. Help me to move to the next level. Help me to move to the next level. Don't let me be satisfied with what I, what, where I am. I want to grow. I want to go to the next level. I want to move to the next level. Introduce me to my next level, O God. Ipahando si brahata. Ko shabahata ya lahasa. Ripa lo krototos. Manderebe koseha. Ima lo brotorohosa. Makurianda hata. Ibrandorobosi. Rosa hata ya. Ima kayandosa. Lo yandebrehete. Makayanderebos. Ye brought to those have the Christian is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Christian is praying for sons of God. Christian is praying for sons of God. When you get to the realm of sonship, Christian prays for you in the realm of Nyaniskos and Telios. You pray for Christian, but you will get to sonship, Christian will start praying for you. Nations will start beckoning to you. Kingdoms will start coming to you. At a place of sonship, you are not talking about towns and cities. You are talking about nations. Nations are coming to you. The Gentiles are bringing their wealth, laying them at your feet. Go, Sahataya. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Give us grace. Give us grace. Take us to the next level. Take us to our next level, O God. In the name of Jesus. 
Lozi brohotaha Ima kayanda Ima tolobosi handa Shikra handu bosi Ramati me handu keha Yodoloza ha Ropa hitna ha tusken Reminna ha to Yibro lo shikhe Grupa handi si handa ha Rima lusi handa ha ta Esha gaham Gondi handa ha ta Yingolo yo si ha ta Fruto handi skaha In the name of Jesus Thank you Lord We are praying this last but one prayer We are asking God for mercy and grace That let mercy and grace hold us up That let God is able to give all grace Make all grace abound to us That we will have sufficiency in grace That we will be sufficient in grace That the grace will be sufficient for us That the grace will hold us up The grace will empower us the grace will take us to the next level that we may go from glory to glory. Give us grace. Give us grace. Give us grace. Help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Enabling grace. Sustaining grace. Exceeding grace. Rosa, great grace. Kipra, Lose. Ripa, abundant grace. Lucy, Handa. Rupa Hadaha, Imahandi, Yemalakudos, Valushe, Ripa Lingaha, Lumaha Turianda, Siniandaha, Kosa Hadim, Ibrandolos, Vredicolosi, Malindolosa, Rita Lahandi, Indala Luceha, Ripolosa, Roma Hatuke, Yikolobosa, Imayan de Hete, Boni Hanahasa, Kamayan Dosiana. In Jesus' name. We are praying the last prayer for Ghana. Ghana will not die. Ghana will live. We are asking God. You interfere and rule in the affairs of men. We are giving you permission. Let your mighty hand come down on this nation. For good. For good. Let your mighty hand come down on this nation for good. And let your perfect will be done. Scatter the works of the enemies. In the name of Jesus. And let peace prevail. Let peace prevail. God's agenda for Ghana will stand. Revival is coming to Ghana. And the enemy cannot stop it. In the name of Jesus. The hand of God is prevailing against the enemy. Has prevailed against the enemy. It is time for the saints to take over. For our God has won the victory. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. In the face of men. And the time has come for the killers of this world. To become the killers of our God. And of his Christ. And he shall rule forever. Revival is coming. Revival is coming. An explosion is coming. In the name of Jesus. No devil can stop it. No demon can stop it. It is established in the spirit. It is subtle. In the name of Jesus, as it is certain in heaven, so shall it be on earth. In Jesus' name, we demand it now. In the name of Jesus, Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise. We give you all the glory. Help us, Lord. Grant us grace. Grant us grace. Grant us grace, Lord. Help us, Lord. Have mercy in Jesus' name.